Okay, welcome and thank you for joining us uh, again for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions and uh, your host today. And uh, I'll tell you, today we are gonna be talking about rainfall and how to use rainfall to supplement your irrigation. And that's funny, right? Because normally people think of irrigation as supplemental to rainfall, but more and more we're seeing that uh, the, the rain is supplemental to the irrigation. And, uh, you know, when I think about irrigation and rain, I think about to smart controllers. I think 14 years ago, when I first uh, started working with smart controllers, oftentimes people would say, well, the great thing about a smart controller is you can turn off all your controllers before it rains, and then you can turn it back on. And, you know, that was 14 years ago, and that was some of the technology 14 years ago, but the technology has cha changed dramatically especially the ET water controllers using Jane Unity. And now you can do so much more with rainfall. Uh, and that's why I'm so uh, happy and interested that Dave Laybourne has uh, decided to present this subject today because you know, here's some of the things I think about when it comes to rainfall. And that is, you know, when, when would you turn a controller off? How much rain fell during your rainfall? So how do you know when to turn it back on? How much of that rainfall was actually usable rain? So Dave's going to answer those questions for us today so you can be a better water manager as you go, uh, you go forward. And, um, you know, I've known Dave Laybourne for over 20 years and uh, consider him a real expert in irrigation. You know, Dave's had experience in landscape irrigation. He's had experience in ag irrigation. Uh, he works uh, at ET Water now handling our enterprise accounts. These are our large entity uh, companies that are interested in saving water on a national scale, many branches, many locations. It's really quite a bit to manage and uh, it's a lot to coordinate and uh, communicate on. And Dave does a wonderful job for us on that. I know he's taking care of our biggest customers really well and we appreciate it. And Dave, welcome uh, to uh, our Lunch and Learn today. Thank you, thank you for the kind words, Richard, appreciate it. So Dave, one thing I was thinking about here, you know, again, thinking about yes. Southern California, 10, 11 inches of rain, um, a year, normally, a lot less on uh, the past few years, but uh, normally that's what we would expect. Um, is that enough to really make a difference for, uh, for my landscape? Absolutely. Uh, I, I like to think about it as uh, harvesting rain, and using the soil around your house or, or your business, using the soil in the landscape, to uh, as a big rain soaker up or so to speak and harvest uh, that rain. And then when you know you've harvested it and you know that it's available for you, you can avoid uh, irrigation as long as that rain has lasted. And uh, in my presentation today toward the end, I'm actually gonna take a stab at some calculations of just how many thousands of dollars, uh, depending on the size of the landscape can be saved doing a good job of harvesting rain. So yes, it does. Yeah, that's really cool because again, you know, I, I think about the rainfall and I think about the days I get maybe a tenth of an inch. Uh, and I think, well, maybe that's not that great. Maybe that's not too helpful. And I think about the days where I get three inches or two inches and how helpful that is. I don't know, not too much. A lot of that's running off too. So are there ways that we can figure out how much is actually usable? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about that and showing some examples of that today, but ET water uh, in particular measures the amount of rainfall and the models that we have as far as uh, soil infiltration and by knowing how much uh, water is already in the soil when the rain is falling on it, uh, then sure, you can, uh, you can figure out how much is actually useful and going to go in and be there for the next day. Yeah, well, that's really cool, Dave. We're uh, we're all interested in seeing uh, how this works. Well, let me uh, let me make some uh, uh, let me make some examples here and and show. So, um, first of all, again, thank you for the the kind words in the introduction. I did work in agriculture for ten years, and uh, one of my favorite things in ag was uh, a, an irrigation dealer in Central Washington that uh, their their slogan was uh, "Just add water." So uh, I like it. <laughs> as an irrigation company, you know, they did a design and they provided the materials and sometimes provided the installation. 
but of course, uh, just add water. So uh, kind of like a recipe, uh, just add water is what you do in order to keep your uh, crop or your landscape going. So um, here's an example using our uh, um, ET water uh, optimized irrigation plan uh, template that shows how the landscape area can be traced out. And in this example, the blue area behind the parking garage is uh, trees and the green area is uh, basically considered to be turf. It has trees growing in it. The total in this particular place is 150,000 square feet. And so just add water. Well, how do you just add water? You, you do it through irrigation and you do it through rainfall. And as you just said, uh, they're both important. So um, again, back to just add water, uh, when do you add water? And this is, you know, it's, it's pretty basic, but it's useful to think about uh, and you add water before the soil moisture level gets low enough to stress the plants. And I, I think that's obvious, but it's also the kind of thing that's just kind of overlooked when people think about water management. And then uh, how much water do you add? And you, you add enough to refill the soil moisture level back to full or nearly full. Uh, and again, um, you don't add, uh, you know, 15 minutes or 30 minutes, you add an, a, a certain quantity of water to refill uh, the soil moisture. So I'm going to use this uh, example. Uh, this is from last, uh, last fall, from August uh, into September uh, of an actual landscape in Fresno. And uh, these are the kinds of graphics that uh, ET Water uses. Let me start in the bottom here with, uh, these are each day. The green lines are the moisture in the soil, represent the moisture in the soil. And the blue lines represent adding, adding moisture to the soil, in this case, adding irrigation, adding from sprinkler so, irrigation. Yeah, so, so Dave, this is answering our question of when to water. Exactly. Uh, when to water it depends on the level of moisture in the soil. And so um, this particular site or this particular zone is uh, trees in sandy loam uh, soil with 12 inch root depth. I want to point out that uh, according to the ET water model and according to uh, which is based on uh, uh, IA principles and whatnot, there's about 1.2 inches of water in this available in the soil. That's this line here, that's full. So at a 12 inch root depth, it's kind of interesting to think about 1.2 inches available. And of that, then you want to start irrigating when you drop down to about 0.6. We call that at ET water, the trigger level. So we're looking here at an amount of water in the soil, even though it's 12 inch root depth of about 1.2 inches, a little over one inch only of total water available in the soil. That's an important concept uh, to get to know. Not all the soil, of course, is water. In fact, only about a 10th of it is. And Dave, uh, depending on your soil type, that changes, is that correct? Of course, yeah, but it's, it's funny, it, it doesn't change that much. Um, you know, sand can hold less and clay can hold more, but then there's available water and how easy is, is it for the roots to get it out? So. When it comes to actually this uh, available water uh, in the model, uh, it's surprisingly um, around a tenth, around ten percent of the depth uh, turns out to be uh, available. Yeah. Um, so going through this uh, graph a little bit more uh, up here at the top, uh, this line here is the ET, and uh, in uh, Fresno, uh, for those of you in California, between late August and September, there is a big change in the in the climate and uh, change in the weather. And so these late August uh, days here are up here pretty high. And then way down here toward the end, uh, they're down here quite low. But as ET changes, goes down and then back up again and up and then way down, um, the take up of water from the soil, of course, changes. It slows down when ET is low. And so you get a lot of days between irrigation and a slow drop of the green bars. It's quite fast um, when ET is up. And so you've got green bars here going down a little faster, a little faster. And so this is what ET water does, uh, decides when to water uh, based on hitting a trigger. And uh, before I talk too much about uh, rain, I just wanted to introduce this concept of uh, moisture in the soil and, uh, and choosing when to re-irrigate or when to refill uh, the zone.
Yeah, I, I love it. You're gonna you're gonna like this one too. One of our former colleagues, Mike Barron, uh, mentioned to me one day, "Oh, ET, it's easy. It's the opposite of rain. It's what's coming out of the soil is coming out of the plant, and um, and you have to replenish it." And I always had that vision, right? Opposite of rain is ET, and rain is rain. So, uh, yep, no, that, that's a that's a very good way to think about it. Um, so uh, the next um, slide I want to talk about now is rain. Uh, getting the most out of your rain. And of course, uh, the obvious thing is install a rain gauge and don't irrigate during rain. But I want to introduce uh, two other just as important um, steps in this whole process. First of all is before rain and second is after. So. This is all about uh, before, during, and after. Let's talk about before for a second. Um, rain gauges don't predict rain. They don't know rain is coming, but it's obvious that you, the last thing you wanna do is refill your soil moisture with uh, irrigation the day before a big rain, uh, because that means uh, point number one here, the free irrigation from the rainfall, you can't, you can't take it because the soil can't bring it in. So, that irrigation that you'd made the day before was uh, basically wasted water, wasn't necessary, and it stopped the rainfall from actually getting into the soil. The soil was already full. And then secondly, uh, you're going to add to the stormwater problem in your, in your community because uh, the water that does hit the soil, since it's got nowhere to go, is going to run off and end up in the storm system. So um, there, it's, it's really important to think about uh, what goes on before and something that can predict rain and uh, adjust irrigation before rain can even happen is very valuable. Yeah, so I, I really appreciate this, Dave, for a couple of reasons. One, um, as I've said for many years, it's hard to get people to be passionate about water management until um, the sprinklers are on and it's raining. And then you pay a heavy penalty <laughs> for doing that. And so in, in the past, what I've seen is people are just happy not to be watering when it's raining. Uh, and, and they stop the equation there. And they don't really think about how do I best take advantage of the rain? It's gonna rain tomorrow, why water today? If it's gonna rain for the next two days, when do I start watering in the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day? Um, boy, I need a tool that uh, helps, uh, helps me measure that and then automatically turns the irrigation back on. Well, yes, uh, I can't agree more. And uh, so the, 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 way to, the way that I like to think about it is uh, this before, during, and after. So just as you said, Richard, during the rain, don't irrigate during rain, and rain gauges are good at this. Um, you know, one, it looks bad to the public, and two, you miss the chance to gather free water. So a rain gauge is a really good item uh, when it comes to uh, avoiding irrigation during rain. And then just as you said, when it comes to after, when do you know when to restart? If you wait too long, you can cause stress. If you don't wait long enough, you'll actually waste because you'll be putting water on top of water and then that'll lead to runoff. And then I guess uh, something else to think about on the after is, well, what if it uh, rains uh, two or three days later after another rain? And what if you could have coasted all the way through uh, to the next rain? And if you irrigate too soon after that, you again, you've put water on before rain. And uh, you don't want to do that. So uh, when it comes to after, um, I've got two points here. Soil moisture reaching a trigger should be the refill uh, to guide you about when to re-irrigate, not uh, so many days after or uh, you know some other rule of thumb. Uh, some rain gauges evaporate to reset, and that's certainly a, a legitimate uh, technology. It's a good idea. But again, uh, that evaporation may be based on uh, local temperature, but not necessarily humidity. It may be, uh, and not necessarily sun, uh, you know, the strength of the sun on the, on the ground. Uh, and it's not a model for soil moisture. It'll be different if it's a zone of trees or if it's a zone of grass. So um, the idea of point number one here under after soil moisture reaching a trigger is really should be the guide uh, to when to re-irrigate, start irrigating again after rain. So uh, here um, we have an actual example uh, of, of what ET water does to handle rainfall. So remember, um, this is the moisture in the soil. This is the ET. In this particular situation from uh, early March to mid-March on this little uh, window of time, 
there were uh, rain events. There was a rain event here, another one here. Uh, this is uh, a screenshot from the 11th of March. And so this is today, and uh, it always looks ahead seven days. And in, uh, in looking ahead, here is a potential rain event on the 15th of March. And all this is important uh, for how ET water anyway, handles uh, when to not irrigate, when to stop irrigating during rain, and uh, then when to restart again. So um, here's today. Looking forward, an irrigation is planned on the 13th of March, and that's because on the 12th of March, the trigger is uh, forecast to be hit. Another irrigation is planned on the 16th of March, because again, the trigger is projected to be hit. This rain here is only a possibility of rain. And because it's only a possibility, it's not showing up in the actual model to contribute rain. Now, uh, when we actually get closer to the day, if in fact the possibility turns into a higher possibility, or in fact it is raining, well then uh, what happens is ET water takes that into consideration and doesn't irrigate because it's not necessary. So um, I also wanna make a point about uh, uh, looking forward in the forecast. Notice how the ET is actually going up even though there is potential rain. You know, in California, uh, we have these heat storms that just seem to come out of nowhere, although they are forecast, they're always forecast, but they do come on suddenly. And ET water uh, by looking ahead also knows when to refill the soil moisture ahead of a heat storm. So you're not just always playing catch up. The whole idea of uh, forecasting in this business is really, really important, both in rain and when it comes to heat. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Dave. I use, like I said earlier, my weather tab on ET water every day. And what I do love about uh, rainfall is it not only gives you the probability of the rain, but how much. And you get a very good idea if it's going to be just the sprinkle or a misting or if you've got a real storm coming. It also shows you things like uh, the, how, how windy it's going to be, the wind intensity, and also the percentage cloud cover. So I think I get a really thorough feeling of what the weather is going to be that day that I wouldn't normally get if somebody just said, well, it's going to rain Friday. That's true. And uh, that interests you just as an interest basis. But of course, all that stuff is vital to calculating ET and knowing precisely what the landscape is going to need, as opposed to just relying on a few of those things. So um, this next slide is, uh, okay, so now what we're doing is we're looking at a screenshot from the 25th of March. So uh, of course, all this happened in the past, but if uh, I, I did this and I, I took this screenshot on the 25th of March, and remember the 15th of March was a day that was gonna be uh, possibly rain. And in fact, it was, it was a half an inch. And so the 16th of March, didn't get any irrigation because the half an inch came in and it wasn't needed. Even a half inch didn't refill the moist, the, the root zone here because not all rain is, um, is useful as we said, but it still, it bumped it up high enough. And then the low ET that followed during this rainy weather uh, kept these green bars from going uh, slowly. And then on the 19th of March, there was another rainstorm. And so at the end of the day, uh, between the 9th of March and the 25th of March, which is 17 days, there were two irrigations, one at the beginning and one at the end, and all the rest of it was handled uh, by rain. And, uh, and the moisture balance was kept above the trigger level, except here. I just want to point out what happened here. Uh, this particular zone or this particular site is only allowed to water um, on uh, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So this Wednesday was just a day that was not allowed to water. Uh, there are some settings with ET water where we could have anticipated this and even watered on Tuesday to prepare for it in advance. Uh, but you know, it's winter time and it's, uh, it, it wasn't felt to be necessary in this case. So um, whether it would have watered here Tuesday or whether it would have watered Thursday, it still would have been only two irrigations over 17 days. And uh, you know, a set irrigation schedule uh, might have watered uh, three times a week, and it might have been eight times over 17 days. Or even a rain gauge might have kept it off a couple of those days, and so it might have been five times over the 18, 17 days, but instead uh, ET water only allowed two. And that's where savings come from, come from. You know, when you can use rain to avoid irrigation and avoid buying water, 
Well, that's where the savings are going to come in. Yeah, Dave, this is a really fascinating chart. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions on it. We've got a few coming in from the viewers too. Great. Uh, looking at Tuesday, the 9th of March. Um, yes. I see that we had some uh, irrigation and some rain. Is that right? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. And so then, and so why didn't it fill the uh, fill the soil all the way up to the uh, saturation point? Well, the amount of rain on the 9th of March just uh, wasn't enough uh, to fill. Uh, remember, um, rain that comes down could come down in uh, in a in a torrent uh, really fast and the soil just can't take it. Uh, that's probably the, the, the reason, I, I don't have all the statistics on this particular day, but we see this a lot. Uh, about a quarter of the rain that falls ends up really being useful for one reason or another. One reason is uh, the soil is already somewhat wet, can't take as much. Another reason is uh, the, the rain just comes too fast. And uh, you know, anytime it's coming faster than sprinkler irrigation does, uh, and, and stays coming for, you know, minute after minute after minute, half hour, uh, an hour or two or three, the soil just can't take it. So uh, not all rain is useful. Yeah. So, and that's a great point. I'm glad you made that. And the other thing that I think we're seeing on the 9th to 10th is, um, and this is a really important concept, I think, and that is, um, even though it rains and not all of it's useful, right? It's not all usable sometimes. And sometimes it doesn't rain enough to fill the bucket. And so you have to add some irrigation even when it rains. But you can see there on Wednesday, there was a potential rain day too. And uh, it might not have watered to fill the saturation point because it was expecting rain the next day. And in fact, the, the rain on Wednesday, this is in the past. So uh, the, the rain on Wednesday did uh, refill the bucket. Uh, and and the, and the, it, it, in fact, uh, the fact that the bucket uh, is still full height on the 11th. Uh, by the way, these bucket numbers are at the end of the day. So the fact that the bucket is still high on the 11th with no rain means that the rain on the 10th actually put a little extra on top, and we do account for that. And uh, that little extra was uh, took care of the ET on the 11th, starting on the 12th and 13th the ET actually started taking away uh, moisture from the soil because you can see the green bars going down. And I love this chart. Yeah, it really shows uh, what, what the potential is of savings just, uh, just from the rain. And really that key element is uh, when, when to turn it back on because you said, if I got a, a heavy rain on the 15th or a rain on the 15th, I might you know keep my irrigation off a day or two, but start it back up. And I would have wasted all that water I got on the 19th. Yeah, so uh, to that point, looking at this, uh, uh, without information about moisture in the soil, probably would have been an irrigation day here uh, or here. Uh, this might have kept irrigation off until about here, probably would have been another irrigation day here or here. And then a couple of days after this, this likely would have been irrigation here, here. So in this 17 days, uh, without the sophistication of knowing uh, how much moisture is in the soil and how much rain actually fell, uh, I believe easily this would have irrigated five days out of the 17 and uh, with ET water, it was two. And that's, that's what produces the saving. So um, if I can just, uh, unless there's some more questions, you said there were some coming in. Yeah, so then the last question here, Dave, was uh, uh, does historical ET help you out in a rainfall situation? Well, I think the answer is obviously no, uh, because rain is what it is, it, it's daily. And uh, unless you know it's coming or unless you're measuring it right now and you know how much you got, uh, there is no, there's no historical uh, information at all that could ever help you uh, schedule irrigation properly around rain. Yeah. And then another another question that came in was, um, so um, my my controller asked me uh, if I want to shut off when the probability of rain hits 10 percent, 50 percent, 70 percent. You know, I set it. And in that way, you know, I, I'm doing the same thing that ET Water is doing uh, with their um, uh, predicting rainfall uh, and predictive analytics with with rainfall. Um, is, is that is that a good comparison? Well, uh, it's a good idea to uh, turn water off ahead of time. So sure, 
but unless you're measuring the amount of rain and then you get back and, and you, you know when to turn it back on, uh, that's just always a juggle. And uh, with ET water, it's all automatic. Uh, the before, during, and after are the three things always to think about. And uh, even if you can do a little couple things before and during, you still got the problem of after. And back to this particular example again, this probably would have been a rain event, I mean, an irrigation event here, and very likely here or here, and very likely here. And uh, those are the afters. And unless you know how much rain you caught uh, and, and, and how much of it made it to the soil and what it did to the soil moisture profile, you're still in the dark. Yeah, I think the light just really went on, right? Um, no two rains are the same. <laughs> some are very heavy, some are very light, and some are in between, but it doesn't seem like you get the two same rains uh, at, at, again. And then it's different. Right. It's, you know, you're up in the L.A. area. It was different for us, um, L.A. to San Diego, but even parts of San Diego are different or you know, especially like Florida, very different uh, rainfall amounts uh, just moving around the city. So uh, so to just turn it off and turn it on at a set time, I, I don't see how that would ever work. But if you're actually looking at how much rain and uh, how much was actually taken and used in the soil and then the controller comes back on, I think that's fantastic. And you just, you just made a point about accuracy of location, and I should have made that point too. Uh, we subscribe to weather services that also bring in the weather radar. And so we know to a half mile how much rain actually fell. And uh, so around a town, uh, you know, especially in the south with isolated thunderstorms, knowing your location and how much is, is huge and uh, keeps you from guessing and it, it makes us very, very accurate. Yeah, so we just had a question come in, and the question is, um, well, really, is that more accurate than the weather station I have in my yard? Yeah. Well, uh, weather station in the yard tells you that it's raining now, that's for sure, but it doesn't tell you, it didn't tell you yesterday that it's going to rain today. Weather stations don't forecast, uh, and then it doesn't tell you, <clears throat> tell you how much. And uh, you got to know all three really to be the most on top of this and save the most water. Yeah, I'll tell you something else, Dave. When I first got in the industry, it's a while ago, I'm dating myself, but uh, doing golf course irrigation, you were going to spend 25000 for a weather station um, to measure weather at, uh, at your locality. I see people now using $40 weather stations and think they're getting some accuracy out of it. And I don't believe that's going to compete with uh, what, what we're getting, especially using satellites and the other um, weather services that we use. Yeah. Now, this, this weather availability is a real breakthrough in our industry. Absolutely. Um, so um, I, just a, a reminder, a review about uh, how ET Water, anyway, uh, schedules irrigation. So the root depth has to do then with the depth of the bucket, which is, has to do with how much water uh, can the soil actually absorb and be useful to the plants. Um, the application rate has to come in. The soil type establishes the water reservoir. We talked about this a little bit. Uh, ET water uh, installs uh, on the software by zone the plant species uh, and sun versus shade and the soil type and whether there's a slope. And then daily ET including uh, forecast weather, including rainfall, uh, then chooses when to refill the reservoir. Uh, all this has another uh, uh, intended consequence, which is um, deep roots are encouraged because uh, by only irrigating when the moisture uh, in the soil is low enough to actually really cause the plants to want to see new water, they're going to grow their roots as deep as they can. And uh, when you've got deep roots, you've got healthier plants, you've also got the potential to go longer days between rain. And so deep roots uh, saves you another opportunity uh, to save a lot of water uh, due to rain. Yeah, I, I love that, um, Dave. And I, you know, I think about myself and just uh, with my own uh, food and water intake. Um, if I'm too full, I'm sluggish. And if I'm too hungry, I'm cranky. So if I can be fed at a good, solid, steady amount, not too much, not too little, don't get too hungry, I operate a lot better. I'm a lot more pleasant to be around. I think we all do. Yeah, and it's a good thing. <laughs> so um, 
just uh, toward the end here, I, I want to uh, throw out some numbers about what rain could possibly be worth. And uh, let me just say that uh, twenty eight hundred dollars uh, is a is a reasonable annual savings of irrigation water for a commercial property of one hundred fifty thousand square feet. How did I get that? Well, um, I'm I'm just assuming that because I'm doing a better job of harvesting rain, I'm going to be able to capture six inches of rain. Uh, maybe I'm going to capture uh, half an inch of rain uh, on, across 12 different rain events uh, or something, you know, something like that. Uh, you're not going to capture six inches of rain all at once. Uh, it's going to be spread out over the year, but uh, I think it's reasonable to think about catching a half a foot of rain, uh, even in a place that only gets 15 inches of rain a year, uh, because um, it's spread out and it does happen among times when you would otherwise be irrigating, as I showed with the example in Fresno. So if you can capture six inches, uh, you're capturing half a foot. And if the landscape is 150,000 square feet and you're capturing half a foot of, of rain, you've captured 75,000 cubic feet of water. And uh, at 75,000 cubic feet of water is 561,000 gallons. And that's uh, $2,800 if you're paying $5,000 $5 per thousand gallons of water. Uh, you know, we could do these calculations for any other size um, and, and you could assume any other amount of depth that we've caught, but that's the way to do it. And uh, in this particular case, it's significant. $2,800 is a lot of money. Boy, it is. And we're just talking about one feature of ET water and Jane Unity. And it's saving enough to easily pay for these controllers in less than a couple of years. So one, I think that's pretty fascinating. The other thing, I think you were really conservative in your uh, $5 um, uh, per unit uh, calculation. I know here in San Diego, uh, it doesn't take a family of four very long to get in, up into the $12 and $16 uh, range. So uh, very uh, conservative calculation, which I always appreciate, Dave. And uh, wow, uh, that, that's a tremendous amount of savings. Yeah. So. Um... Just uh, finishing off a little bit with uh, what we do at ET Water anyway, as far as the hardware, um, this, this picture here, this little guy here is a hermit crab. A hermit crab with one wire connects to a host controller as long as the host controller is compatible and most are. And the hermit crab is what communicates with ET Water and the cloud and, and the gets, the, gets the weather data. And the hermit crab sort of takes over then and sets up those schedules about uh, when to water and how much. Um, there's a smart box uh, here, and then within the smart box is a standalone controller, a traditional type controller wired to each one of the solenoids, and it has the communications inside. And then uh, sometimes we'll use the panel here, just this panel, and uh, replace the panel of an existing pedestal. And that way uh, you can get into smart base controller without uh, having to actually remove and re re uh, replace a whole big pedestal. That's, That's beautiful because I know at times I've spent two, three thousand dollars on just the uh, the pedestal. Yeah. So uh, just being able to do a panel swap, man, I'm I'm going to save a ton of money. That's true, and it's been very, very, very popular in our business. Um, a a cell phone with Unity Mobile on it uh, allows you to wander around and start and stop zones in the field, and this is just huge for the the people in installation and then during uh, like a wet check. Um, uh, while they're finishing up the landscaping, uh, you know, trip. And then um, I just uh, also just want to uh, finish off with uh, the sophistication of two-way controllers. So, you know, you can do a lot of things with uh, two-way communication. You can confirm that irrigation is happening. You can confirm that the landscapers are checking when they're supposed to be checking. Uh, you can confirm that solenoids are getting reasonable uh, electrical current. And uh, this is an interesting uh, side feature of these kind of smart controllers. There's actually an amp meter included in the controller, and it's measuring the amps going to each one of the circuits when uh, when they're when they're engaged. And sometimes we find that the amps are way way too high. There's probably an open circuit out there. Sometimes we find that the amps are off the charts, and we get a closed circuit or a short. And then uh, so uh, these are all things that show up as alerts back to the customer. Um, as the unit is doing its uh, its 
it's daily uh, irrigation, well, irrigations, whether they're daily or every five days, you know, whenever it's, it needs to do an irrigation. And then when a flow meter is installed, uh, the, the, uh, the flow meter is sending real time flow data to the smart controller and the smart controller can identify whether there's high flow or no flow or low flow and uh, send a signal. Uh, and then there's and that's reporting. So, that's so valuable, right? I think all of us that have been in the industry for even just a couple of years, right? Have heard that story about the uh, broken main line or the broken supply line. Uh, I didn't find out about it till I got my water bill and it was, you know, $10,000 uh, 60 days after it started leaking. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid it happens too often, but uh, uh, smart control like ET water can detect that sort of thing. And then, uh, then there's reports. And uh, I work, as you said earlier, with uh, large customers with lots and lots of uh, sites in their portfolio. And they're looking at uh, reporting for sustainability purposes. And so uh, we have lots of different ways to report the fact that we are matching ET, we're staying under ET, uh, whether it's in gallons or um, whether it's in inches or uh, you know, lots of different ways to get at that. And we can compare to a baseline and, and, and actually show that we're being in compliance with the goals that are set by the company. So um, that's what I had prepared to say. And I've been answering a few questions along the way and happy to answer some more uh, as we uh, finish off the time here. Yeah, Dave, I just want to say a uh, great job. I think, uh, I think you really uh, made, uh, presented in a way that made this understandable for uh, lots of us. Uh, it, uh, it's in one hand, it's a simple concept. Rain supplies irrigation and uh, saves you money, but how it's actually done in that second and third step and that level, I know is going to make us all better water managers. So uh, thank you for presenting this today. I really appreciate it. To those of you tuning in, uh, thank you. We appreciate your time. We hope we're hitting the mark. Remember, you can see all our webinars, well over 100 of them now, at janesusa.com forward slash training. They're all free. It's really important for us to educate on water conservation and sustainability for free. That's a, uh, it's a core principle at Jane. And then, uh, and then finally, um, you know, we're coming to the end of the year and those of you looking for CEUs, continuing education credits for your IA certifications, many of our trainings are uh, apply, uh, apply for that, uh, fill that requirement, and you'll see one tab there that shows all of them in one place. So again, Dave, great job. Thanks for helping us out today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay, great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we are going to be back on Friday with uh, Jillian Martin. She's gonna be talking about uh, something, I saw this a couple months ago and I thought it was so fantastic, uh, talking about the life of a dying tree and how much more you get out of a dying tree if you leave the stump and a good portion of the tree in place. Very interesting stuff. Hope, uh, hope you'll join us on Friday. Thanks everybody, have a good rest of the day.